Good evening, everybody. This is Mr. David Pope. I'm speaking tonight on the topic of the role of women in the Vietnam War. Uh, this topic was originally a live uh, lecture at Skepticamp, which was hosted by the River Valley Freethinkers in the city of Fort Smith on August 12, 2017. And uh, there was live video of this event, but unfortunately the video that I have is just too poor in quality especially the audio uh, of the event. It was just, just unusable. I, I might post that live video uh, separately, but I think uh, it, it would be better for me just to double my efforts and just do this uh, offline form of the same lecture. And I hope you indulge me for just a few minutes of your time. In my time in service in the United States military, I had the opportunity to conduct two fairly historic port visits, uh, first on board the USS Vandegrift to Ho Chi Minh City, also known as Saigon, Vietnam, in November 2003, and also on board the USS Gary, we conducted a port visit to Sahanakville, Cambodia, in February 2007, and both of these were part of what is known as the normalization of relations between Vietnam and the United States, as these were the first port visits to these two countries that had occurred since the end of the Vietnam War. As some of you may know, I'm the author of a fantasy fiction book series known as Slender Dragon Eye, a novel perspective of the psychology of warfare, which recently I've begun to do a read-through of on my YouTube channel. As it turns out, I was inspired to do a different type of project that uh, ended up taken up a lot of my time and, and, and intellectual resources that actually put the second book in the series on hold in order to complete it. I wanted to write a movie script, but it ended up being so, so huge, so involved, uh, so much information to be put into it, that I actually had to expand it into three different movie scripts. And if you think it's easy to write a movie script, imagine how difficult it is to write three different movies simultaneously, it ended up being a lot more difficult than I thought it was going to be. Now, I'm not going to tell you what the movie project is, because I don't want you stealing my idea, but let's just say it's the classic tale of boy being, each girl being, and they both join the Marines to get sent to Vietnam. Now, for the male characters, it's fairly easy. All I have to do is put them on the plane and fly them out to Quezon and leave them there, where they, uh, crawl into the bunkers and dodge artillery shells for three months, and that's the siege of Quezon. I exaggerate, of course, they, they weren't always in their bunkers, but I felt the story was sort of incomplete. I, I wanted to do something different that really hasn't been done before. I wanted to explore what the actual role was of women in Vietnam. But just think about Every war movie that you've seen about Vietnam, you've seen movies about the uh, Green Beret, the Air Cav, Army Infantry, Marine Corps Infantry, Stars and Stripes Reporters for Trinity Infantry, and then Air Force Radio Disc Jockey. But at no time have you actually seen uh, American military women actually portrayed in any of these movies, and that's what I wanted to change. Now, of course, there were women portrayed in some of these movies. Uh, think about the movie Full Metal Jacket, the classic scene at the end of the movie, where we found out that the uh, sniper that had taken pot shots at the platoon for the past 30 minutes was depicted as being a young woman. Now, this is true. This is highly accurate. Both the NVA and the VC fielded women in both direct combat and in combat support roles. Uh, another place that they were was along the Ho Chi Minh Trail, where they served as guides and they maintained the trail. Uh, also on the other side of the fence, the RVN uh, had both uh, Army and Air Force women's auxiliary members. Uh, this is shown here, a picture of uh, RVN women auxiliary members uh, posing with some of the American women that helped to train them. Now, there are also civilian women shown here, a group of Red Cross donut dollies outside of the uh, Tansa Nut Air Base in Saigon. Uh, you had uh, government workers, you had teachers, you had missionaries, you had uh, uh, humanitarian aid workers and uh, USO entertainers, and so forth. Now, my personal favorite was this lady right here, Bobby Keith. Uh, she started out her tenure in Vietnam 
As a volunteer worker with USAID, uh, she also had a habit of flying out to the field to uh, visit soldiers in the field. Uh, she always asked their hometown where they were from. And as you can see in this picture, a map of the United States, where she would take their hometown, uh, look it up through Telex, uh, get the information and say, well, San Francisco was 73 degrees and rain. Well, this did two things. Uh, first of all, uh, the soldiers in the field get to uh, pump their fists and say, Yeehaw, I'm famous, Bobby Keith said my name on air. But also, it's a little bit of a uh, touch of home. When you say, well, 73 degrees in rain, well, my folks at home aren't doing too bad. And this was a good morale booster for them. But of course, this topic is supposed to be about military women in Vietnam by civilians. But before I go into that, I wanted to explore a little bit about my own uh, personal writing process so that you can understand exactly uh, what my mindset is. Whether it's uh, a chapter in one of my fantasy fiction works or a scene in, in the movie script, I'm sort of working with this uh, box, okay? Think of it as a, a shoebox diorama that you uh, might have completed when you were a kid. In this box is going to be everything, the, the location, the characters, time of date, weather conditions, weapons and equipment because it's a war movie, the dialogue, sequence of events, special effects, background music, I mean, everything that you can think of, it all gets placed into this box. And this is why it's easy to write about the men who served in Vietnam because there are just so many books written about the Battle of Quezon. Uh, if I get stuck on something, all I need to do is pick up the books and say, well, uh, yeah, I need to change something about it. I need to change the dialogue or the characters. Something's just not right about it. There have been incidences, in fact, in which I had to scrap entire scenes uh, because I just got something completely wrong. And I had to, to read through the material uh, and put the right characters, the right dialogue, the right equipment, time of day, everything that was supposed to be there in order to get it right. But it's not so easy with the women. I found a few uh, very good anthologies. Uh, women in Vietnam by, by Ron Steinman. Women in Vietnam Veterans by, by Donna Lowry. And both of these are anthologies of, of, of different women who have talked about their experiences in Vietnam. And I had to read these things and sort of suss out the types of information and the time frame that I needed to use. But I ended up reading the whole thing anyway because just fascinating the types of things that women did in Vietnam. So in my reading and my uh, research in the topic, I asked myself a series of questions that sort of guided me along. Uh, number one, were there women Marines in Vietnam? And yes, the term women Marines is the correct historical term to use. Now, if there weren't women Marines in Vietnam, well, well there goes the story. Uh, what, what I needed was what I call the a linchpin relationship. Uh, I described the, the uh, male marine, female marine, fall in love and get married. But if there aren't any women marines in Vietnam, then I can't have that story. Uh, there has to be some other sort of uh, sort of that linchpin relationship. So I can sort of have these scenes that bounce back and forth between the men and the women. Uh, so if there are no women marines, I can't have that story. Second, if there were in Vietnam, then when were they in country? Let's go back to my box. I know what the box is for the men. The siege of Quezon is between January through April of 1968. So the women Marines, if they were in Vietnam, would have to be there in country between January through April 1968. And if they were not, that also ruins the story. Uh, next, I need to know where they were stationed. Well, you can say, well, they were in Vietnam. Well, duh. Well, uh, Vietnam is a big country. Well, it's a long country. It's the Chile of Southeast Asia. I can't say that women Marines were in uh, Da Nang or something when they were, in fact, 534 miles away, which is not the specific distance. Next, I need to know what did they do, their, their daily lives, not only at work, but what they do during their off time. How did they live? How did they conduct themselves? Next, what was their age and rank? This is important because the the husband in this linchpin relationship is 
approximately 20 years old and a corporal. I can't say that the, the wife in that linchpin relationship is a 39 year old master sergeant, which is also oddly specific. I must have gotten that for someplace. And finally, what types of dangers did they face? Uh, I, I can't have a story in which a woman just uh, charges with reckless abandon into the field with guns blazing if nothing of the sort actually happens. The story needs to be accurate, at least in my own view. Now before we go into all this, we need to take a look at the raw numbers. There were 2.6 total U.S. military personnel in Vietnam, uh, 303, 600,000 total American casualties, with 58,000 of them uh, killed in action. The grand total number, however, and I've read this in different sources, that the grand total number of casualties was somewhere in the neighborhood of two to three million. Okay, now that includes everything, both the American, South Vietnam, North Vietnam, and also civilians. Two to three million, okay? Of the American military personnel in Vietnam, there were somewhere in the neighborhood of 11,000 women. Now, excluding the civilians, because we want to focus just on the military personnel, there were somewhere in the neighborhood of 7,500 to 8,500 U.S. military women in Vietnam. And try as I might, I can't get that number any more specific. The curious thing about it is all the women that served in Vietnam were all administratively listed as men. So when Donna Lowry and her research tried to work out the number of women who served in Vietnam, she was stuck. She can't just say, well, given the number of all the women, that number would be zero. She tried to look up her own name, Donna Lowry, and she found out she's listed as a man. Nobody know, really knows why uh, the military did it that way. It just a, a, a quirk of these things that nobody really knows reason for. Now, of these uh, 7,500 to 8,500, there were eight U.S. military women who died in Vietnam, and we're going to go over those eight women later on in this presentation. Of this number, there were 36 women Marines deployed to Vietnam, which answers our first question. Yes, there were women Marines in Vietnam, uh, 28 enlisted and eight officers. Now, the first to arrive was Master Sergeant Barbara Jean Delisky, who was listed as the first woman Marine deployed to a combat zone, uh, arrived sometime in March of 1967. A few weeks later, we had Captain Vera Mae Jones, the first woman Marine commissioned officer, deployed to a combat zone. Now, for the next question, where were they located? Well, well duh, they were located in Vietnam, but let's be more specific. They were all sent to Saigon. We could be more specific than that. They were all sent to Tansanut Air Base. Let's get a little bit closer. They were all assigned to the Military Assistance Command Vietnam, Tansanut Air Base, Saigon. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our box. Now for the typical assignments of military women in Vietnam, uh, to the surprise of one or two of you, almost all of them were nurses, somewhere in the neighborhood of 87 to 90%. Uh, most of them army, but maybe nurses were on hospital ships in a single field hospital north of Quantree City that existed later on in the war. We also had Air Force flight nurses, normally stationed in the Philippines or Guam, but flew in medevac flights out of Vietnam. Now, the rest of them were administrative personnel, approximately 1,200 of the total women. This comprises of almost all of the non-nurse women, uh, mainly clerk typists, intelligence specialists, supply specialists, and so forth. Uh, a large WAC detachment was a long bin logistics base, with other women assigned to MACV, as we explained, and other headquarters units. There were a small number of uh, physical therapists, lab technicians, and and other personnel. Now the army had the largest group of women in Vietnam, both officers and enlisted, mainly field nurses, but also uh, WACs assigned to administrative duties. The US Navy sent 
female officers only, as there are no enlisted Navy women in Vietnam, and mostly nurses and hospital personnel. The U.S. Air Force sent officers and enlisted, mainly flight nurses, also other enlisted uh, airmen personnel. The women Marines, of course, sent the smallest number of female personnel. Officers and enlisted, as we described, only administrative personnel. They probably would have had a larger group if they had nurses, but the Marines don't have their own medical personnel. Those, those are all uh, Navy personnel that are assigned to Marine Corps units. So doctors, uh, nurses, and also uh, chaplains are all Navy personnel. Also note that there were no Coast Guard women in Vietnam, which of course raises the question, were there Coast Guard personnel in Vietnam? And yes, there were. There was one Coast Guard squadron uh, doing uh, river operations and, and coastal security and things of that nature. But there were no Coast Guard women in Vietnam. Now for the age and ranks. That there was, uh, for all intents and purposes, no upper age limit. Uh, we've met Master Sergeant Deliski, who was 39. Uh, Chief Warrant Officer Lucky Allen was 41. And Lieutenant Colonel Andy Ruth Graham, which we will meet again later, was 52 years old. There was a lower age limit. Uh, they had to be 20 years old and a minimum rank of corporal. And there was only one exception. There was a 19-year-old private first class who was a WAC assigned to the Long Bin uh, logistics space, but nobody really knew how that actually happened. Um, service in Saigon was considered independent duty. The military wanted women who were somewhat older, higher in rank, and demonstrated in maturity, and therefore women need to be at least 20 years old and corporals or an equivalent rank. And this works out, of course, as I explained, our linchpin relationship, uh, the male marine and the woman marine married to each other, can in fact both be 20-year-old corporals. So that works. So that can still be included in our little story. Now I want to discuss a little bit of the sort of dangers that the women faced. And this is going to be in addition to the normal dangers that you would normally expect to find uh, in a war zone, the uh, uh, mortars or artillery and machine guns and stuff like that. Uh, four specific things I want to discuss was the TED Offensive, PTSD, Agent Orange, and the Injury, Illnesses, and Death. The TED Offensive. Now I'm going to be focusing on the 1968 TED Offensive in this presentation. That is not to detract from the events that occurred in the 1969 TED Offensive, but it is outside of the range of what I want to discuss in the movie project. And the following is a statement by Sergeant Mary Gladell, now known as Mary Gladell de Zurich, and I'm not going to read through this whole thing. You are free to, of course, pause the video so you can uh, see the entire statement. Uh, but I'll summarize. And essentially, what she's saying is that on the uh, morning of the Tet Offensive, uh, her and her roommate, uh, Polly Wilson, another uh, woman Marine, uh, they were assigned to the Plaza Hotel in Saigon, and they went outside the in the front door of the hotel and waited for the bus ride to work and they kept waiting finding to go back inside to find out that there was not going to be a bus into work as she said after Ted everything changed and this caused me to sort of uh, stop and think I mean she was a marine she was in a combat zone was she not aware of everything that was going on around her, I mean, what was going on. But then I remember something that I read from Ron Steinman, who's the chief of the MC News Bureau in Saigon. And he stated that when the TED attack happened, uh, the explosions, machine guns, air raids, sirens, and all the rest of that, uh, kind of turned over his bed and looked at the time, it was 12.30 in the morning, and his first reaction was to simply roll over and go back to sleep, because, well, in charge of the news bureau, he has a lot of work to do, right? So, in the midst of all the craziness that was going on, the machine guns and explosions, air raid sirens, uh, the spotlights shining through his head, helicopters flying through the air. In other words, just another night in Saigon. And that was the reaction of a civilian. So now I'm, I'm sort of thinking of this reaction of this Marine in somewhat of a different light. 
But what I did find was uh, interesting is what the women Marines did when they were stuck in the Plaza Hotel for days and days on end while the rest of the military tried to figure out what was going on, uh, including a statement from Master Sergeant Barbara Jean Delinsky. What they did is they raided the uh, hotel restaurant on the top floor and started serving food for all the soldiers fighting in the streets. And that's right, these military women, these strong, proud, military feminist types in the midst of this huge military event that was going on, all the danger that was going on, their first inclination was to kick down the door to the kitchen and started making sandwiches. Well, like I said, I, I would love to write about this scenario in which the women just charged forth into battle with guns a-blazing, which would be a problem because none of these women actually knew how to fire weapons. They weren't trained in marksmanship. They weren't trained in much of anything at all had to do with field duties. They were administrative personnel. They were clerk typists. What else were they supposed to do? Except go back to the room and twiddle their thumbs for four days. No, they, they did what they needed to do in order to make life a little bit easier for everybody else around them. And we can admire them for that, even though it's not really all that exciting. We can still appreciate what they did. Now, for the Wax at Long Bin, it was a little bit more exciting because they were actually in the middle of the fight. Uh, it was early morning hours of uh, January 31st. There was Captain Murphy uh, sitting at her desk uh, counting out uh, military script. These were different colored uh, strips of paper that they used instead of money to get ready to pay the women on February 1st. And suddenly, in the middle of the night, they all got attacked. What happened was that the VC attacked the uh, ammunition bump, dump at Long Bin. This is a huge explosion, as you can see on, on the screen. Now, Lucky Allen stated that uh, when she heard the explosion, looked out the window and saw that the, of course, that concussion wave just, just coming in from that ammo dump directly towards their barracks and it hit them and boom, just knocked them all to the ground. Uh, military script went falling all over the place. Uh, Captain Murphy was there just started yelling at people to get to their bunkers while she herself was trying to get under the desk, which was already occupied by a Red Cross donut dolly who wasn't even supposed to be there. So that is definitely more exciting and definitely a lot more direct uh, danger that the Wax and Longbin faced that other women in other areas of Saigon uh, didn't actually face themselves. PTSD. Of course, let's talk about what PTSD is not. And no, Gersh Kunzman, there's no such thing as temporary PTSD. What I found out in my studies of women in Vietnam, that they've written about their experiences, that they're still suffering 40 to 50 years after the fact. Uh, they still have the nightmares, they still have the, the nervous conditions, they still have sleepless nights. There, there's, there's no getting around this. It's a very serious issue that I can't stand guys like this uh, trying to make light of the situation. Now, I want people to understand, of course, that I'm only a mere layman when it comes to this topic, but the, the best that I can understand that PTSD is related to the hippocampus, is a small organ in the center of the brain. What is not known is if a person has a regular size hippocampus and is exposed to traumatic events, and that hippocampus shrinks, and therefore they have a higher than average susceptibility of PTSD, or if a person begins with a smaller than average size hippocampus and then faces traumatic events, and they are less capable of dealing with those events. And again, as I said, I'm only a layman when it comes to this topic. It's a, a subject of active research. I just wanted to let people know precisely where that research is headed. Now, apart from Gersh Kunzman and his temporary PTSD, I've discovered uh, two different books that deal with this particular subject. 
uh, both of them Vietnam veterans, from two different sides. I'll explain. Uh, the first is the book Three Days Past Yesterday, A Black Woman's Journey Through Credibility by Doris I. Lucky Allen. She was uh, an intel analyst who was in fact the first person to predict the 68 Tet Offensive. The other one is The Sorrow of War, written by Bao Nin, and this one is largely the Vietnam version of the novel All Quiet on the Western Front. Uh, that is to say, All Quiet on the Western Front was written by a German soldier in World War I. This is a largely fictionalized account of his experience in that war. The Sorrow of War by Bao Nin is basically the same type of book written by a North Vietnam soldier who served basically for the entire war. Uh, and it's largely a largely fictionalized account of his experiences in the Vietnam War and a rare occasion for people here in the West to be able to read about the experiences of North Vietnamese. Agent Orange. Now I wanted to explore Agent Orange as a separate topic because it affected men and women in different ways because it affected the reproduction organs more than anything else. Uh, men, of course, constantly regenerate new sperm cells so they're not really affected in that manner, but they had a tendency to develop skin conditions and uh, skin cancer uh, and other maladies later on in life as they grew older. Women, on the other hand, are born with all the egg cells that they ever have. So they give birth to children with major birth defects, development disabilities, or ADHD. And in Vietnam, it's even worse, where Agent Orange seeps into the soil, into the groundwater, so new plants were planted and grown in damaged soil, leading to new cases of Agent Orange, and the process keeps repeating themselves. We're now on the fourth generation of children in Vietnam being born with these severe birth defects of Agent Orange, which occurred 40 to 50 years ago. The eight women we lost. Now, I'm not going to detract from uh, women who were wounded, and there were women who were wounded, uh, developed illnesses and things like that, but there were eight women who paid the ultimate price in their service in Vietnam. Now, there were eight American military women who died in Vietnam. Uh, all eight of them were nurses, seven of them Army nurses, and one Air Force flight nurse. Uh, the first two, Lieutenant Carol Ann Elizabeth Drasba and Lieutenant Elizabeth Ann Jones, died in a helicopter crash near Saigon in February 1966. Captain Eleanor Grace Alexander and Lieutenant Edward Diane Orlowski died in a plane crash while returning from a field hospital. Uh, there was a push in a neighboring field hospital and they went to help out, but they died returning to their own field hospital in Quinan in November of 1967. Lieutenant Pamela Dorothy Dornavan died of an unspecified illness in Quinan in July 1968. I tried to figure out what this uh, illness was that she died from, but I, I just couldn't get that information on there. And uh, Lieutenant Colonel Andy Ruth Graham, the one that I spoke of earlier, who was uh, 52 years old, uh, succumbed to a stroke and was evacuated to Japan and died in Japan in August of 1968. The last two I wanted to spend a couple more minutes explaining, so they're not going to be put in any particular order. Captain Yuri Therese Klinker was an Air Force flight nurse and died in a plane crash near Tansen Nut, Saigon on April 4, 1975. She was part of a mission known as Operation Baby Lift uh, that flew out of the Philippines. And their mission was to uh, pull uh, children out of an orphanage in Saigon and get them to safety where they would be adopted mainly by American families but in the in the interest of fairness there were also uh, Australian and Canadian families about four percent of the children were adopted by Australians and Canadians uh, credit where credits due of course what happened was that the airplane had a mechanical fault on the rear cargo door which opened in mid-flight and this caused explosive decompression throughout the cabin, which uh, severed control cables to the rudder and most of the ailerons. 
they were able to get the the plane turned back around and back to Saigon, but it crashed in a in a rice paddy about five miles from the runway, uh, with the loss of 155 killed, including 73 of the children, but 173 uh, survivors. And one of those killed was, of course, uh, Mary Therese Klinker, who's listed as the only Air Force flight nurse to die in Vietnam and one of the last American military members to die in the Vietnam War. First Lieutenant Sharon Ann Lane of the 312th EVAC Hospital in July was killed in action in a rocket attack in June of 1969. Uh, she was the only nurse to have died due to actual enemy action. Uh, they were working in their field hospital to perform their normal duties when they came under attack. And uh, Lieutenant Lane just happened to be in the ward where the rocket attack happened to happen. It was simply this uh, freak occurrence that could have happened to anybody that happened to have killed Sharon Lane. And this was one of the women that I wanted to find out more about in my, my reading of the different sources. But what I found out is something that I didn't really like. You see, the, the women, the other nurses that she served with in the EVAC hospital were extremely bitter. Sharon Lane had only been in country for a few weeks. She was barely there long enough to learn people's names. You know, she was bright and uh, kind of sunny and chipper and wanted to be friendly with everybody. And this spread the nerves on the women who had been there longer. Uh, she hadn't been there through the, the monsoon rains, with, through the water up to their hips, uh, through the vast majority of attacks in the heat of the summer. In other words, Sharon Lane had not been in country long enough to become jaded. And well, this bothered me when I first read it, but of course I, I can't dictate to these women what their response was supposed to be. All I can do is... is reported in this in this lecture uh, it took me a long time to figure out why these women were were responded to this in such uh, hatred and vitriol and, and jadedness but ultimately I'm thinking that they responded with hatred and vitriol and jadedness because hatred and vitriol and jadedness was the only thing that they had left you understand that their only other option was to curl up in a fetal position on the ground and start to cry. But they can't do that. They still have patients in the ward that they have to take care of. And they still have to put on this brave face. And not even a brave face, they have to put on this facade. They, they walk into the warm and sit down next to their patient. And they lie to them. So much stronger than you were yesterday. You're improving. You're getting better. You're going to make it home. You're going to be just fine. And see, this woman had this obsession that they wanted to be there. They never wanted the patient to die alone. So that nurse simply sat there and waited for the patient to finally fade out. Then they walk out of the warm, the ward, and go back to their, their tents, sit down and write the letter home to the soldier's family. And she lies again. He went peacefully, she would write. He wasn't in any pain. And his last thoughts were of you. And my final thoughts of my, my read-throughs and my, my research of women in Vietnam, it comes from an understanding that I'm, I'm over 40. I served in the military for some 12 and a half years in the Army and in the Navy. I remember what it's like being a young soldier in the Army, being a bit, a bit naive, a bit young, uh, inexperienced about the world. 
And I'm reading these stories of these women that were written uh, from a time when they were 20 years old in corporals. And I couldn't help but think that these women could be my younger sisters, given my, my current age and my experience. I've read about women who deployed to a combat zone not knowing what they were getting into, with very little training on how they were supposed to, get to conduct themselves in the field, and did the very best that they could in these extraordinary circumstances, often putting their lives in extreme danger. And I'm very proud of everything that my little sisters had accomplished in Vietnam even if their only duties were to walk into a hotel restaurant and begin to serve food. And I feel that these women who served in Vietnam definitely deserve the Hollywood treatment. They deserve somebody who, say, has served in a combat zone, just like they have, to be able to read from their experiences and put it down on paper and write the script. And I felt that that person could be me. Thank you for watching.